people are still joining the webinar event, but I think we can slowly get started because it's three minutes past the hour here on my clock. And then uh, by the time I completed this short welcome, um, I hope uh, everyone will have joined by then. Um, so let's just get started. Uh, my name is Oliver Kirsebaum. I'm the senior staff scientist on the Meridian project. And on behalf of the Meridian team, I'd like to welcome you to the second uh, webinar in uh, our uh, series of, uh, in our winter webinar series um, that we're hosting uh, in November, December, and January. So um, as you may know, Meridian is a three-year project funded by uh, CFI, uh, Canada Foundation for Innovation. Um, and we also receive support from the member universities, which include Dalhousie, University de Quebec, SFU, UBC, and UVic, and also industry partners, uh, notably uh, JASCO and Exact Earth. Um, this webinar series in particular is funded by a grant from DFO, uh, under the Ocean and Freshwater Science Contribution Program. And I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Pisces Research Project Management for their help with preparing and running um, these webinars. So um, at Meridian, our mandate uh, throughout the last couple of years has been to support uh, the ocean research community through the creation of software tools for managing, analyzing, and visualizing underwater acoustics data primarily. And so as part of this webinar series, uh, we will be showcasing some of the tools that we have created in the last couple of years. Today's webinar event uh, will focus on fish sounds and more specifically, we shall hear about a new online catalog of fish sounds that is under development. Um, the webinar is split into two parts, as you can uh, see on the slide here. Uh, the first part will be a presentation given by Audrey uh, Luby, who is a PhD student at the University of Miami. And the second part uh, will be a presentation um, given by Amalis uh, Riera, who is a Meridian team member and also a bioacoustician at the University of Victoria. Before we get started, I just, uh, as a final thing, I'd like to mention uh, um, that this webinar is being recorded uh, and we will make the recording available uh, through our YouTube channel within the next week or so. Um, and if you go to our YouTube channel, you'll also find already a recording of last week's webinar about underwater soundscapes. So without further ado, um, I'll pass the mic on to you, Audrey, and uh, I'll stop sharing my screen and then um, sh you should be able to, uh, to bring your presentation up for everyone to see. Great. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, so as uh, Oliver mentioned, my name is Audrey Luby and I am joined by Amelie Sriera today. Um, we will be your presenters for this webinar. Uh, to get things started off, we have a poll um, to learn more about each other's experiences with fish sounds uh, and also a fun guessing question of how many fish species you think are known to make sound. While you're filling that out, I'll give a quick introduction of myself. I am a graduate student at the University of Florida under Charlie Martin and Laura Reynolds. I began the work we're going to talk about today two years ago while I was working on my fairly unrelated master's thesis on submerged aquatic vegetation restoration. <laughs> I have now started my PhD this year and will be focusing on fish sound production and coastal soundscape ecology for my dissertation. Uh, Amelie, would you like to take a second to introduce yourself too? Hi everyone. I am a research associate in the Juanes lab at the University of Victoria, and I've been studying fish sounds since the late uh, 2015. My research has mostly focused on validating and describing new fish sounds to ultimately contribute to a catalog of all known fish sounds. Thanks, uh, So we still have the poll answers coming in, but it looks like everyone's answered. So it seems like a lot of you here have 
uh, studied or plan on studying fish sounds before, 71%. Uh, the rest of you have at least heard a few fish sounds before, and none of you uh, are showing up here today thinking that fish just make splashing sounds, so I guess that's a good start. <laughs> um, and then how many species make sound? Uh, we have the, the biggest answer is somewhere around a thousand, but some of you answered all the way from half of them to all of them, and a couple of you admitted you have no idea. <laughs> Um, so with that, uh, we can get started on my presentation. Uh, let me just close. Great. So before we get started, I wanted to take a second to acknowledge all the people and institutions who have been involved in this project so far. It has truly been a collaborative effort across three countries and several institutions. We have also received a lot of help and advice along the way, and I'm personally just so grateful to all of the amazing people I've gotten to work with and learn from so far. Uh, so with that, on to fish sounds. Fish sounds have unique benefits as a sensory cue underwater. Acoustic cues can often travel further than other types of cues and their propagation does not rely on water clarity or light levels like visual cues, nor is largely dependent on water movement like chemical cues. It therefore makes sense that many species of fish would evolve the ability to use sounds to communicate. There are two loosely defined types of fish sound production that we'll talk about today. Some fish sounds, like the calls of my local Gulf toadfish, are produced deliberately in association with a particular behavior or situation, frequently with specialized sonic organs or structures, and are generally used for communication. You can think bird song as an analogy. I will refer to these as active sounds, but they're often also called intentional sounds. For those of you here who may not have heard a fish sound before, well, I guess that's none of you, but just in case you want a reminder, here is what the call of the Gulf toadfish sounds like. Play that one more time. Uh, but don't worry, there will also be more fish sounds to hear later. Um, passive sounds like the splashing of mullet or chewing food and sometimes referred to as incidental sounds may not be associated with specialized sound producing physiological structures nor with specific behaviors or situations, though they may still serve some signal function. Unlike with active sounds, it's assumed that all fish can produce passive sounds in certain contexts. I should note the distinction between the two sound types can be murky, but still useful when trying to talk about fish sound production. Research of these fish sounds has an extensive history. Aristotle and Pliny the Elder described fish sounds and possible fish hearing over 2,000 years ago. And fishers have long known fish can make sounds evident from common names like croakers and drums. Contemporary scientific research on fish sound production began in the late 1800s and then underwent considerable expansion in the mid-1900s due to technological advances as well as naval and business interests in the subject. The rate of studies examining fish species for sound production has steadily increased to the present day. As you might expect from such an extensive history, there have been numerous efforts to catalog fish sounds, such as the prolific work of Marie Fish and her colleagues, but all of these endeavors have been limited to a particular region or fish family. As such, the diversity of fish species that have been shown to produce sounds still remains unclear. There is also a need to build on previous estimates, such as the commonly cited number of 800 actively soniferous fish species that is widely considered an underestimate and lacks a published list of which 800 species are described. These are due to some unique difficulties presented when studying fish sounds. Underwater recording equipment is not as readily available as terrestrial recording equipment, which has allowed for greater research and citizen science efforts to study sound producers like insects, frogs, or birds. There are also around tens of thousands of fish species, much higher than the roughly 120 species of marine mammals. Additionally, fish sounds can be much quieter and less consistently produced. Despite these challenges, however, we still know that fish sounds are incredibly important. Active sound production in fishes parallels the ecological contributions of sound production in other sound producing groups like birds and marine mammals. Fish are one of the largest groups of sound producing vertebrates and have the greatest diversity of sonic organs. Fish have been shown to produce active sounds in every behavioral context, including feeding, reproduction, aggression, defense, and social interactions. Other organisms, including dolphins, birds, and vertebrate larvae, may use fish sounds as a sensory cue to hunt, prey, avoid predators, or find suitable habitat. 
Well, the capacity to produce active sound in fishes is not as taxonomically omnipresent as it is in bird and marine mammal species. The substantial amount of active luciniferous fishes known to be out there demonstrates the analogous importance of active fish sound production. But because of the lack of awareness of fish sound production, research into them has been deprioritized in comparison to these other groups. Fish sounds are not just important to study ecologically. In times of increasing environmental changes, it is becoming ever more important to have accurate, affordable, and creative methods for ecological assessments of underwater ecosystems. Passive acoustic monitoring is a remote sensing tool that entails using hydrophones to record underwater sounds, as many potential applications in marine, brackish, and freshwater environments. Fish sounds in particular can be and have already been used to detect and monitor spawning for fisheries management, to map the spread of invasive species, and to assess habitat complexity and degradation, among other applications. Despite these evident advantages, the use of passive acoustics to monitor fish populations has been historically constrained by the lack of a global survey of known soniferous species and an accessible library of sound recordings to identify fish sounds as already exists for other taxonomic groups. Fish sounds are also important when considering human impacts on underwater environments. The production and detection of fish sounds and their associated functions can be impeded by anthropogenic impacts such as habitat degradation, changing climactic conditions, and noise pollution. As we gain awareness of the number of fish species that use acoustic cues, the potential impacts of human activities becomes a more pressing issue. But, and you may be sensing a theme here, it has been difficult to assess the population and community level effects of human activities on fish sound production due to a need to understand more completely how prolific fish sound production really is and the when, where, and why it happens. So I, along with my amazing collaborators, set out to address these critical gaps in information related to sound production in fishes. This project came about in phases, so I will walk through our initial data collection and a follow-up more detailed data collection, along with some of their findings. Then Amelise will discuss our goal to compile fish sound recordings, the design of a website to make all of this data more accessible, and our plans moving forward. Uh, as Oliver mentioned, we'll have I'll have uh, questions after my presentation, so feel free to add them to the chat or write them down so I can get to them at the end. So let's start with the most fundamental question. What fish have been shown to make or to not make sound? To find all of the references that included any examination of a fish species for sound production and basic information on the species that was studied, I conducted a systematized review. My systematized review was similar to a systematic review in that it had explicit reproducible methodology, sought relevant studies from a number of different sources, used predefined exclusion and data collection criteria and assessed the strength of data collected, but it still fell short of some of the requirements of a fully systematic review. For example, I was the only independent reviewer at each of the exclusion and data collection steps of the review. I conducted formal searches in two online databases and I collected additional references outside of my formal searches. Once I removed duplicates, I was left with over 2,600 potentially relevant references. These references spanned over 60 countries and were written in 11 different languages. They covered the years 1874 through 2018 and included journal articles, dissertations, abstracts, and even a music record from the year 1952. I assessed these references for relevance. In other words, that they have an independent reporting of fish sound production examination of a species identified to the species level. I excluded about 1900 references, which means 772 references were relevant to our research objectives and qualified for data collection. So in reading all of these references, I found 1,153 unique fish species that have been examined for sound production. Of those, only 125 were not shown to make sound when studied, though they may still be shown to produce sounds upon further examination. Regardless, that still means there are records of 1,028 species that were shown to make some type of detectable sound. Of those, 959 species made active sounds, 138 made passive feeding sounds, and 140 were shown to make other passive sounds like splashing or digging. And not only do we have these total numbers, which could be interesting in their own right, 
but we also know exactly what species were reported by which studies. This opens up a world of possibilities for studying global trends of fish sound production. Let me give you an idea of what sorts of questions can be answered with this data. For example, where have actively sinifer species been found or not been found? I looked at the global distribution of actively sinifer fish species using native species data for FAO fisheries designated areas from fish base to create this bubble map. The larger and brighter the circle, the greater the number of actively sinifers fish species. At least one actively sinifers fish species was found in every region except for around Antarctica, likely more due to a lack of effort as though for those four regions only had two species that were even examined for sound production. The majority of the other regions had at least 100 actively sinifers fish species. So actively sinifers fishes have been found around the world except for Antarctica, at least so far. Uh, we plan to take this question a step further in a subsequent study by looking at whether there are greater absolute and relative numbers of sinifer species at lower or higher latitudes, and other researchers may be able to ask other questions with this data. On the more local level, I also use this data set to find out that the Suwannee estuary in Florida that I work in is home to at least 75 fish species that produce active sounds, which is roughly 25% of the total number of fish species in the area caught by our fisheries independent monitoring program. So what about questions related to the taxonomic distribution of actively sinifer species? While I haven't performed a full phylogenetic analysis yet, I was able to look for qualitative trends. This complicated looking circle is a phenogram or taxonomic tree. The tips of the tree represent the individual ray finned fish species that were examined in my review. I was able to map whether the species were shown to make active sounds in blue or not in black, and I labeled the fish families with the most actively soniferous or non-actively soniferous species. What this figure shows is that active fish sound production is spread across the fish species examined. While there are clusters of non-actively soniferous species, they are found in several different taxonomic regions, and actively soniferous species are found throughout. This suggests that active Sound production is not limited to a select few fish families, as some might think, but is in fact a taxonomically prevalent behavioral trait as has long been known by fish bioacousticians. We can also use the data collected to statistically predict a new minimum number of sinifera species that exist. I was able to use a rarefaction technique to predict that if the number of examinations that resulted in the determination of an actively sinifera sp fish species were doubled, the number of species that make active sounds would also almost be doubled to 1,435 actively sonifer species. To put this into context, fish base lists roughly 35,000 species of fish, which would mean 4% of fish species are actively soniferous. Even this, though, is still likely an underestimate based on the lack of an asymptote in the extrapolation curve, so there are likely many more, possibly thousands more, out there. At a minimum, however, a global estimate of 1,400 actively sinifers fish species is still substantially higher than currently published estimates. In addition to the simple yes-no of whether a species made sound in a particular study, I also collected basic data on how the fish species were studied and whether there was some doubt expressed by the authors about their conclusions. Of the two 2,437 individual examinations of fish sound production included in the review. Authors expressed doubt that the species they examined were correctly identified, that the species they examined did or did not in fact produce sound, that they correctly identified active versus passive sound, or on the physiological explanation behind sound production. In addition, 232 species were only examined for sound production physiologically, as in by looking for sonic organs, or without visual confirmation of the species being listened to. Unsurprisingly then, some of these uncertainties led to contradictory results among studies, such as whether a so-called chatter sound is produced by sea robins, weak fish, or cusk eels. Since 61% of the species were examined for sound production in only one reference, these instances of doubt highlight the importance of multiple examinations of fish species. This additional data on uncertainty can be used to assess the need for follow-up studies on any particular species in the data set. So the numbers I just presented on are based on the initial data collection up to the end of the year 2018, but I am not going to leave it there. I have already updated my data set to September of 2020, and will continue to update it as more research on fish sound production is conducted into the future. 
But even with all of the potential uses of our initial data collection, there are still limitations with such basic information. We wanted to know more. So our absolutely wonderful undergraduate researcher, Santiago Bravo, conducted a follow-up data collection. This data collection was a lot more involved, so we decided to start off with a subset with plans to expand later. The subset consisted of the 268 references that included at least one marine subtropical fish species found in the review. Santiago recorded whether the species produced sound in the lab or in the wild, what types of behaviors were associated with sound production, and the different terms used to describe the sound they produced, for which we found 68 different terms. My personal favorite was the so-called boop sound produced by some toadfishes. He also documented any more detailed descriptions that were included in the different references, such as what time of day the fish produced sound or what the frequency range of their calls were in. All of this descriptive information can be used to identify potential species producing an unknown sound in a particular passive acoustic recording, as well as to study fish sound production behaviors more generally. So while it's been fun using the data to look for patterns in fish sound production myself, the primary goal of this work has always been to make the data publicly available as an information source and data set that can be used for future research efforts. So um, before I take your questions, I'm sure at least some of you are curious about when all this data will be made available to look at for yourselves. Uh, so for the initial data collection, we have a publication using that data that is currently in review. So that data set will be a made, made available on an open access data repository upon publication in the form of Excel spreadsheets. The data will also be updated and versioned from the year 2018 to 2020 and beyond. We also have two publications in prep from the follow-up data collection, and so the data set with more detailed information will be published either alongside those publications, also in a data repository, or with the website, whichever comes first. We hope that this data will prove useful for other researchers like yourselves for your own work. We are open to collaborations as well, so please feel free to reach out. Uh, so with that, I can end my screen share, and if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Uh, you can either send them in the chat or uh, unmute yourself, I suppose. Hi. Hi. Uh, Nicola Bailly speaking here. I work for, for Fishbase. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question on the estimation of, of the numbers of soniferous uh, species. Have you tried to, to, to sum all the species of the family where there is at least one soniferous species? Um, yes, yeah, so with the, the statistical test that I used, which is called an extrapolation and rarefaction curve, um, there are a lot of limitations to the extrapolation. Um, so I was only able to go to double the number of examinations, which is why I stopped where I did. Um, for the families, um, we have tried to look at them on a family by family basis, but the total number doesn't actually change that much. So we just decided to do it on, on the full species list. Um, but we plan to look into this further um, and look at more detailed at the um, taxonomic, uh, the taxonomy of the soniferous fishes that we found and maybe do a more complicated uh, phylogenetic analysis as well. Thank you. Thanks. Anyone else? Uh, I see Ben Wilson in the chat said, any habitat links to the proportion of soniferous species, shallow reefs, deep sea, pelagic, or too early to tell? We also plan on looking into this further. 
Um, so the, the data that I presented on was sort of our, our initial look into the data, but as you can imagine, this data set is so large, there are so many things we can do with it, or that hopefully some of you can do with it as well. And we haven't been able to investigate everything up to this point, but definitely interested in looking at habitat links as well um, to see if, you know, coral reefs are pretty heavily studied with soundscape ecology, so maybe they have more sinifer species on them, or it could be biased based on the, the studies on them. But we plan on looking into that future. Yeah, thanks. Anyone else? Yeah, yes, me, me again, if I can. Yes. Uh, about your your database structure, when you extracted the, the description uh, from the references, did you try to uh, st structure the fields and have control vocabulary for a number of of um, of descriptors? Um, sure. So I think uh, for the more detailed follow-up data collection, I think that's what you're referring to. Um, yeah. How we how we went about it in for sound producing sound production in fishes, we don't have established terminology yet. Like there are for marine mammals, like a click is always a click, for example, or they're at least getting there. Um, so what we did was instead collected the exact words that the authors used to describe the sound. And the sim similar for the behaviors um, that we collected, but even for my most basic data, if, if the authors thought that a sound was an active sound versus a passive sound, I went based on what the author's uh, intent and understanding was to try to remove some of my own biases from the data collection, as well as to ensure that uh, the data was more true to the original study. Yeah, I'm saying that because the more you structure the data, the more analysis will, will be possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we will be able to subdivide. So for example, for the behaviors, we could say like, okay, all of the reproduction, uh, spawning, uh, pre-spawning, all of those behaviors can fit under the broad umbrella of reproduction so that we can analyze it a bit more simply. Um, does that get to it a bit more? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I see there were two in the chat. Um, Amelie, do I have time for one more or would you like to hop in? I don't want to... Go for it. Yes, you have all the time you need. Okay, great. Um, so Kelly uh, asked, thank you for your talk. Uh, from your analyses, do you have an idea of the proportion of Cineferous fish taxa exist with more than one sonic mechanism? Right. So I, um, we, uh, a lot, so much work has been done describing the different sonic mechanisms in different fish families. There have been far more extensive reviews than I could possibly imagine doing on my own. Um, but one example is in the Siliriformes, hopefully I get that right, the catfishes, they have um, different sonic mechanisms or that they've evolved um, uh, different times. So they've evolved or lost their sound production later. Um, so we plan on uh, using my data set to investigate this a little bit further, um, but for that there are definitely um, greater expertise elsewhere that uh, discuss the subjects of sonic mechanisms in particular. And I did not collect data on that um, in my data set. And for Paolo, um, did you detect any patterns relating sounds, diversity, complexity to phylogeny? Um, not entirely sure I understand that question, but I think similar to what I've been saying is <laughs> we are still, we have barely scratched the surface of this data, so we plan on looking more into specifically phylogeny questions as um, I am not very strong in my evolutionary biology. Um, and we uh, do not have extensive data on the sound, um, acoustic metrics or characteristics yet, but that is a part of the phase that we are going to move into next and that Amelise will talk, uh, speak to with her presentation. Um, any last 
questions or I can use that as a good segue to go over to Amelie's. So now that Audrey has done the amazing work of compiling a database of published research on fish sounds, what can we do to make it widely accessible? The idea of creating a website that would serve as an online catalog of known fish sounds came from analyzing passive acoustic recordings in search of fish sounds, which felt like looking for a needle in a haystack. When I started working on fish sounds, I wish there was a resource I could check to compare known sounds to the mystery sounds I was encountering in the recordings. In addition, there was a the question of how many fish species make sounds. So a look into the literature brought up various estimates that kept popping up and um, were just that estimates. So according to the literature, there were over seven or 800 species of fish known to produce sounds. But as far as I know, the original literature review that led to that number was not published. Audrey's recent inventory revealed 959 species have been proven to make active sounds, and her statistical estimate suggests a minimum of 4%, or 1 in 20 fish species are actively soniferous. So now that we've looked at the question of how many species of fish make sounds, let's look at existing web resources to compare known sounds to the mystery sounds we might have. Many of us use FishBase as a go-to resource to check the most up-to-date information on fish taxonomy and nomenclature. Yes, all 34,000 plus species of them. For those of you who aren't familiar with FishBase yet, it is an extensive database that also includes information on biology, tropic ecology, life history, uses, and historical data for all known fish species. And even though it isn't their primary goal, they do offer a small collection of fish sounds. To navigate to the fish sound section, we can start on the search page. We scroll down through their various search options until we get to the information by topic. And there is the fish sound section. Here's the list of species for which sound clips are available. There's a total of 90 species with available sounds. And they come from the Fish and Mowbray Sounds of Western North Atlantic Fishes collection. So, for example, let's check the Atlantic herring. There's a link to the sound file, and we reach a page with some information on sound production for the species and a download to the sound file. Another resource to check fish sound recordings is the Discovery of Sounds in the Sea, also known as docets. They have an excellent library of different types of sounds, including fish sounds. Here's a list of species for which sound clips are available. There's a total of 28. And this is an example of what we see if we check the recordings for the Plainfin midshipmen. Then we have Rodney Roundtree's website, Fish Ecology, with a section dedicated to soniferous fish. He has sound recordings for at least 46 species. The NOAA website has recordings for two fish species and the British Library has one single recording of haddock sounds. Finally, the Macaulay Library also has a few fish sounds, though they grouped all amphibians, fish, and mammals together for the numbers they report, and I couldn't find out what percentage of that corresponds to fish uniquely. The search function allows filtering for all animals, but it isn't possible to check for only fish sounds. So a bit of trial and error returned a species they did have sounds for the damselfish. And I'm sure they have many more. <laughs> there might be other websites with fish sound clips, but those are the ones I'm aware of. So going back to numbers, all those sites present clips for less than 100 species of fish, which makes me wonder how I could listen to sounds from the remaining 800 plus species. We assume hundreds of recordings are kept in storage in individual labs with limited access, aside from directly asking the lab to share the sounds. And we would like to build something more extensive and open access. So our multi-institutional team partnered up with Meridian, and in particular, Sara Villa, to design a website prototype and SQL database structure. Juan is lab member Haley Davies created a logo for us and we decided to name our website Fish Sounds as a tribute to Fishbase. 
what I'm going to show you is a prototype, so not a live website yet. Here's our home page. The project is based on Audrey's inventory of fish sound production research. Since we focus on peer review publications, the sound clips will all be linked to one or more papers. The buttons on the top right corner offer three ways to search for sounds and studies. One can search for a given species of fish, for sounds of specific characteristics, or for publications. Let's start with search for fish. So we get options to select by taxonomic um, <clears throat> classification or region, climate, zone, water type. So for example, let's search for active sounds. And this is what would be returned. We get a list of species, um, a bit of more information on their taxonomic state and how many sound records or references are for each. So if we click on the first species, it leads us to the species page with a species description, sound recordings, and references. So let's check the first. Here we get some more detailed information on the taxonomy and the regions, and we can also view more information if we want on fish base, for example, here. So the second um, section would be sound recordings. We get a spectrogram to get like just a very quick uh, thumbnail view. We can listen to the sound. We get a short version of the reference underneath uh, the call name and just very basic um, measurement da data. So if we click on the spectrogram, we get more detailed measurements that come from the reference um, and more links to view back to the fish or the reference. If we click again on the spectrogram, it just zooms in on, on the image with the waveform as well. So we can also access directly all the metadata on the reference, um, which shows what type of sound was described, sound names, behavior description, sound observations, observation environments, and what diagrams are included in the paper. We can hover for even more information, such as the sound description or sound names, the observation environments, and the behavioral description. Then we click on the species and it brings us back to this page. So finally, we check on the references and it shows the full citation and a table again with some information on the sound type, examination type and examination environment. If we click on the full citation, it brings us back to the reference page. Now, the second way to search for sounds or for species would be the sound library. We can sort by default or we can filter by a range of different measurements or also by family or region or water type. So let's look for active sounds. And this is an example of what would be returned. Again, it gives thumbnails of the spectrogram so we can visually look at them quickly say if we're having our own passive acoustic recordings and have a mystery sound and we're like, I would like to find whatever um, matches these sort of measurements and then it will return those thumbnails and we can have a quick visual search and see if anything might remotely look like it. We can also quickly uh, just play it. And then um, it shows again some very basic information, the short citation that is associated with each sound and some very basic measurements. So we click on it and it brings us back to the detailed page of the measurements, which also gives the opportunity to download the file. Um, and the final button would be the research summary. So here we would 
filter by author name or year or grade literature or the type of literature and the language. So let's look for example between um, 1975 up to date and in English. And here's an example of what might be returned. Again, get the full citation and the species name and the common name. So if we click on the full citation, we get back again onto the citation site. And if we click on the species, we go back to the species site. And clicking on the logo, we go back to our homepage. So this is it, our website prototype. It's still in construction, but we hope to get it live as soon as possible. And again, for now, we will focus on peer-reviewed publications. Uh, down the road, we might expand and add a section for sound recordings that don't have an associated publication, perhaps a forum for people to seek expert opinions and discuss possible sound identifications. And way down the road, we might collect additional recordings of a given sound to provide a training library for machine learning. They're all ideas in development. And now time for a pop quiz to test your fish sound identification skills. So here on the left, I have put some spectrograms corresponding to four different sounds of four different species with the name of the sound as per that publication. So we have a drum, a growl, a jackhammer, and FRTs, which stand for fa um, fast repetitive ticks or farts. So I'm just going to play them all. And then I'm going to have you guess which species it is uh, for each sound. On the right, we have the Arctic char, the Mozambique tilapia, the street grenard, and the striped cuskiel. So um, I'm going to play all the sounds and then let's see who can identify the species correctly. This was A. So I'm going to play A again. And now let's see who is A. Is it the Arctic char? Is it the tilapia? Is it the street grenard? Or is it the cuskiel? Think about it. And the answer is the tilapia. Awesome. Now I'm going to play B again and see if you can identify it correctly. Which one is it? The street grenade. Some of you might have remembered from the website that I showed earlier. It was featured quite a bit. I'm going to play the jackhammer again. So is it the Arctic char or is it the Cuskiel? The Cuskiel. And finally, I'll, I'm just going to play it again just for the sake of it. And that's an FRT, an Arctic char FRT. Good job. Thank you so much for participating. Survey question is, once it is finalized in live, do you think you will use our website? Yes, no, or maybe? All right, looks like a majority of yeses. One note that I would be very curious to hear um, what you got out of the talk or if you have any feedback and some maybe which are 
totally fair. I hope, I hope we will um, get to the satisfaction of the, meeting the needs of most people. So as we're still in construction and hopefully will go live soon, we would like to add as many sound clips as possible to all the information that Audrey has collected on the um, published um, research to date. So if you would like to donate sound clips to Fetch Sounds, you may send me an email uh, with the sound clip, uh, send it via Dropbox to Audrey or use Google Drive to send it to Kieran. And it is very important that we get some information so that we can link the clip to the proper citation. So important to know the corresponding publication, uh, the species and the sound name. And I've created a Google form so far for anybody who would like to share some uh, sounds with us uh, for now. And hopefully once the website is live, we will have a submission form. So it will all be in one step. And that's it. Thank you so much. Sorry about the confusion with the mix up between the sounds and the names and the quiz that was extra complicated. Um, so I would like to thank so much all the people who have donated sounds so far as we were just beginning to test um, how we wanted to design this and how it could work. Um, Meridian supported the funding for the website design and SQL database building phase. And we're now like, examining our funding options to build the website and to ensure its long-term viability. And we welcome any suggestions anybody may have on that. And we'd love to hear from you. So there's another feedback form here uh, that should be very quick to fill in case you would like to share something privately or you, you may do so now if you feel comfortable with it. And with that, I would love to answer any questions. I will leave the slide up for a bit in case anybody wants to save the link. And yeah, I'd be happy to answer any question. Let's see how I can go back to Zoom. Well, Amelie is sending that perhaps I could field some of the things in the chat. Uh, yes. I see Ingrid um, said, do you have some way to acknowledge who sent the fish sounds? Um, so the, as you may have noticed in the design of the website, we make a point of including the citations in every single instance, the recording or any information about the fish sounds are, are posted. So we, it, it works in a system similar to um, FishBase or iNaturalist or something where we, we make a point of putting citations absolutely everywhere. And I also took the time to go through and add even more additional details such as ISN numbers or DOIs for every single reference that I collected in my data set to make sure they're as easy to find and cite as possible. We do not want to take anyone's work from them. We just want to make it more easy to find. Um, for Nicolas' question, um, for creating a project in iNaturalist to deposit sounds instead of pictures, which will avoid you to develop a, avoid having to develop a deposit system yourself. Um, that is definitely interesting and something we will work, uh, look into. One of the reasons why we decided to build our own website structure for this instead of using sort of existing like Macaulay, for example, or, or other things like that is that we have, um, such an extensive, uh, we our, our data is structured very differently from how most of those sound recording websites or citizen science programs operate and that we have references and publications for every single thing. Whereas iNaturalist is more, or our other websites similar to that is more devoted to like single people who deposit on there. And we also have so much more information that we pulled from the references themselves that we wanted to be able to showcase all of that in our own way, in a way that isn't super feasible as far as I can tell on a lot of the other options that are out there. Um, but for the deposit system, we are definitely still trying to figure out the best way to take sound or like receive donations of sounds from people. So I, I will definitely look
look into that. <laughs> okay. uh, cool. Uh, uh, from Clara, uh, or Clara, sorry, um, my criteria to exclude papers from my systematic review, I, I excluded at the abstract level, um, if, if the paper seemed like it had absolutely nothing to do with fish or if it had nothing to do with bioacoustics. So I even looked through all of the papers in the full text, if it was talking about fish hearing, just on the off chance that they would be mentioned some fish sound production as well. And then at the full text mm -hmm. level, I ex only excluded papers if they didn't talk about sound production at all, or if they didn't identify a species to the species level. So that was the primary reason why some, some references on fish sound production work might not be in my database as it currently stands is that it just didn't, I, it might have said like Opsanus spa. Um, so then I didn't collect data on that to, <laughs> in a form, some way to limit the number of references that I collected data from. But um, the way I organized my data collection, I am able to see exactly what references were excluded in that way. So I could even go back through my database and collect information from those papers in the future if I decided that that was useful or if someone else wanted to as well. Um, are there any other questions? Thanks. Time is almost up, but I think we have time for one last question if anyone is, has, has a question for either Audrey or Amelis. I'll take one quick side. Amelie's uh, made sure to emphasize this, but just to emphasize it one more time, <laughs> um, we want this website to be for the community, for researchers like yourselves, and we are still building this, this website. So if you have any feedback on ways that we can make it better or suggestions for ways to make our lives easier, or uh, if you're interested in using the data for, for projects of your own, feel free to reach out. Um, I'll send my email in the chat right now, um, but also there's a feedback form uh, that Amelie sent in the chat as well. And we just, we want this to be for, for everyone um, and we're open to suggestions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and also at first there was a little bit of confusion, I think about um, like people wanting to maybe donate all sounds or have all the sounds that anybody can record that this is for now, I'll I said, but I'll emphasize just with those that have been published. So then it is structured, it can be cited, it can be traced back to where it came from. And, and it also is more structured and easier to follow through. So for now, it will just be for sounds that have a corresponding publication. And just one quick last question that I saw Ingrid sent, how do the rest of us contribute since we have done many of the same literature searches as you? I would be, ha once my data set is available, hopefully my, the publication that we have from this will be accepted soon. Um, and once the publication is out, if you want to cross-reference with any of the literature that you think should be in there and might not have made it or that I might have missed. Like I tried my best to collect as many references as I possibly could, but I probably missed them. So that would be one way. Or if you wanted to just contact me, if you do have literature you want to make sure is in there, or if you have more extensive literature lists, um, feel free to just reach out and we can talk. <laughs> Thanks, Santiago. <laughs> Audrey, Amelis, I'm, I'm going to jump in here. Uh, thank you so much for putting this webinar together. It was awesome. Um, and just thanks everyone for tuning in uh, and supporting uh, this event and this, this, uh, this project. Um, I'm just going to, before we uh, end here, I'll just uh, share with you contact details from Meridian. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we have been recording this webinar. Uh, we will be posting it to our YouTube channel within the next week or so. So, um, and to find that YouTube channel, just go to our website and you'll see the, the link at the top right corner. Um, and we'll also be uh, uploading the, the slides from the presentations that you just saw to our website. Um, and finally, I uh, just want to 
again to mention that we have uh, more webinars coming up uh, in the next weeks. Um, and uh, you can just see here, there's uh, two in December and then another three in January that you're very welcome to join as well. So with that, uh, I think we will end the webinar. Uh, thanks again for joining and hopefully see you again next week.